So let us move to the second scenario, uh, which is how has your personal or your family's migration story influenced your life, music making, research, etc. Uh, Umi, why don't you begin? Sure. Um, so I'll talk just a bit about my band since that's my current project. Um, and so Bitter Bitter Party is the name of this band, and uh, I often describe to people that we play ghost pop, and of course, like that sort of raises another set of questions, like what is ghost pop, and um, and so like actually this. In Chinese, it's called Gui Pai Pu, which is uh, Gui, it means ghost. Pai Pu is the sort of transliteration from Chinese. Um, I made it up. It's sort of like clapping score. Um, and for, for me, uh, it, it's sort of um, this way of like accessing kind of family and um, ancestral. Um, musical forms of knowledge, um, either through like archival research or um, through like media, like scavenging, sc scavenge work, <laughs> scavenge hunting. So, so basically like really discovering kind of seeds and ideas that are connected to my history and my bandmates, like personal and family history. And then sort of taking one little idea, taking a rhythm and taking a lyric or taking just a concept and blow it up. And um, and the reason that we call ourselves Bitter Party um, is because I think all of us got into this notion of like exploring bitterness. Um, I think in the sort of the East Asian context, there's bitterness can mean lots of things. It can mean positive things like uh, difficulties in life and um, challenges and struggles. Um, and then there's also kind of the, the opposite of that bittersweet. And so like drinking tea, you know, like the ideas to strive toward like tea that gives you an, a sweet aftertaste. And so I think really playing with the notion of the sort of th that relationship, that tension between bitter and sweet and, um, and to sort of delve into kind of the hardships of our life, like in the 21st century Los Angeles in California, as we're experiencing challenges, you know, trauma um, and, and doing so while like listening to my grandparents' music that also explored bitter things. Like, you know, they were super into uh, Anka, um, Taiwanese forms of Anka um, and, and, you know, using kind of that repertoire to 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 help me sort of see how they were able to thrive um, between wars and after the war, um, dealing with like migrations, urbanization, um, you know, having to bring up a family after the war. Um, it just you know I think their stories themselves have been so inspirational and um and i decided to dedicate so much of um the space that i have with my band in terms of our songwriting process to um, exploring these different family histories thank you uh Jimmy? Hi. so i think i might have actually jumped ahead and maybe answered part of this in my previous response but Thinking about sort of how my family's journey has informed my work, certainly the fact that we moved through all these places and kind of that I was immersed in Indian culture very heavily for part of my life and then Hong Kong culture for a part of my life and Chinese as part of that and then American culture for this latter part, all of those I think have informed one of the biggest themes in my work which is this idea of just appreciating cultural diversity and appreciating different sort of musics and points of view for what they are. So one project I had done that I was actually really excited about, and we escaped getting canceled by COVID by, I think it was a week and a half or two weeks. Right before all this happened, I, I had done a piece with LA Opera and Pasadena City College where I teach that I think was really one of my dream projects. And what it was, was a cantata that was about how different cultures have looked at the stars and the stories that different cultures have, have told about the stars. And uh, Eric, you had mentioned right at the start this idea of sort of this whole story circle being about celebrating the things that, you know, we have in common and that are alike. 
um, across different cultures and then also the things that make us different. And it, it's interesting because that was exactly the premise of this piece, to take the stories that we tell about life and death and love um, from all these different points of view and bring them together into a single piece that's about just celebrating what's different about us and also what's similar between all of us. So I think just this idea of celebrating culture, celebrating music from different place has, has been really a, a important theme in my work. And the other thing I would say is I, I'm not from a family of musicians. My family have been lawyers and teachers and occasionally bankers. So, you know, it's interesting when I talk to my parents about what I do with work and with music, um, we talk about it very philosophically. And one of the things that sort of I get from my mom that was always really important to her and I think it's rubbed off to me rub off on me is this idea of music as a force to try and bring people together and um, that can seem a little bit simplistic and a little you know a bit of a cliche but I, I do think there's a power in that when we are performing together and making music for each other that we connect in a way that maybe is hard to do when you're not doing it in terms of music and in terms of sound so that also is something that I think is really fed into my work and what I want to do and what I want to say in terms of the music I create Great, thank you. Yes. Uh, Alex, please. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question thinking about my, my parents, well, my family's migration story. My father, my father is a white American. His family's been here for generations since probably the, the 1700s uh, in the United States. My mother um, immigrated here uh, in, her, in her 20s from Hong Kong. And um, although I found out later that my that her grandfather, her maternal grandfather, actually lived most of his life in the U.S. and Canada, um, but you know had four kids um, back in Canton and in, 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 in Guangdong and in Hong Kong and my grandmother's family. But he he anyway he spent most of his time in North America, which has always been fascinating to me, just knowing very little about that story. But I, I think for me how it's shaped me. My mother uh, spent. A, um, my father was on tour a lot. Uh, he was the, the musician, classical musician. My mother uh, raised us. Um, and I think that impacted, you know, her, her worldview um, growing up in, uh, in Hong Kong, I think definitely impacted the way that I um, saw the world. Also, at the same time, being biracial, I think I became an astute observer and um, really um, having to navigate uh, different diverse kinds of, of cultural spaces um, and not just geographically but even just in in the small town of Blacksburg Virginia where I grew up um, you know whether it was like hanging out with the Chinese community or um, being you know with a, a group of uh, soccer players or whatever just the, the, the diversity of the kind of different cultural spaces that I was a part of and then also going to, to visit um, my my extended family whether it's in Hong Kong or in central Florida um, always this sort of in-between space and just I think for me that's impacted how I have um, how I've approached um, the work that I do um, which I specialize in Afro-Brazilian music um, and I think for me that's it's been uh, I'm probably I don't want to jump ahead too much in the conversation but uh, I think for me being being aware of navigating these different kinds of cultural spaces and um, not quite being of it, but also being of it in, in different ways and figuring out how how that informs my practice. Um, it's something I'm I'm continuing to 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 consider um, as I as I go through a, both my performance practice and my pedagogical practice as well. Um, so uh, I'll I'll leave it leave it there for now, but. Uh, that all those all those elements are are really important. Great, thank you so much, uh, Chisan. Okay, um, so um, speaking of that, seems like um, we are all related to Hong Kong. <laughs> I I'm from Hong Kong too, and um, when you know when I before I came here, you know I. I just like, you know, I'm studying tuba and uh, it was an interesting story that I can tell you guys. When I, after the, um, the last year in high school, you know, we, you know, we have to decide where you want to go to, you want to go study abroad or you want to, um, you know, you're going to a college or, or you quit, you got to start working. 
So I wanted to, you know, go to music school. At that time, my tuba playing was just like, okay. <laughs> and, um, but when I told my um, band director, he's a, always a happy guy up leaving. When I called him, I was like, um, hi, um, band director, I, I want to study tuba, study music after high school. He said, okay. And he would just ask me one question. He said, um, is your family, I was like, family by then is mean like your parents. You know. Is your family depends on you, depends on you in the future? Okay. Um, I don't think so. Yeah, you all said. And so it's like that. Then I was like, oh, I, I was like, I have no idea why he asked that until now. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay. Then I, I, this is how I get into the music. You know, and um, after that, I, I after my four years, five years in APA, and I, I maybe so people from Hong Kong, you know, there's the uh, Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. Then I graduated, then I came to um, Boston. Um, that, that kind of interesting because um, I don't have my family with me. I just came here by myself. And then um, the next year I, I, I had my wife, you know, we, we met in Hong Kong and then after that, she was from Taiwan. She went back to Taiwan to work. Um, and then I, I study in Boston. And after a year, um, his dad also make fun of us and saying that, hey, daughter, you keep calling son in the United States. Back then, was the, the long distance call is very expensive. It's like, it costs a lot. Why you guys just get married? Then you don't have to pay for the long distance anymore. You don't have to pay for the long the, the telephone company. You guys just get the money and spend yourself, you know. So we, we got married and um, she came to, you know, we, we came to, we, I got her here and then we started, you know, our life here. And it was kind of like, makes sense to me, you know. Yeah, it's kind of uh, economic. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and then we, we, we yeah, we, and then my wife, she's a Gujang player and a Guqing player. So um, when, you know, all through my life, I was like, um, you know, I started with the band and then I, I started, you know, to do classical, being a classical Western music trained musician. I have no idea about Chinese music back then until I met my wife and I started to, you know, pay more attention to that. And um, there was the, um, the first opportunity that I got to conduct the Chinese music ensemble is because my wife, try to do a solo with the ensemble. And back then they were like not, they don't have a regular conductor, it was just like maybe some music student take the pose, take the job. And then after a year or two, when they graduate, they left. So they, they don't have a, like a permanent conductor, you know, to do that. But I also did some conducting when I was in Hong Kong too. So for, but for school band, you know, for band, not, not really a Chinese ensemble. But you know, their music, their universal, you know, what you, you hear something different, you need to fix that. I, I, I hear that. It was like, how about let me try to do some help for you guys? Because it's only my wife in the ensemble. She couldn't handle, you know, being a soloist and then a conductor, you know, a coach, every, you know, like a taking like a multi positions. Then I, I started to conduct and they finally realized, oh, you can do that. Then um, after that, the, the director of the ensemble, the Chinese ensemble, is like uh, approached me and say, "Hey, son, do you want to be the conductor of the Chinese music ensemble?" I said, "What me?" And then I, I look at the music. Was like they gave me, you know, the music that I look at is the, um, you know, the Chinese music. They're all numbers, right? Back then I was like, "God, jeez, I don't read that music." You know, I, I sort of know that how to do it, but I'm not familiar with that. It was like what the ancestor of the digital music. <laughs> this is how I always say that. You know, the Chinese music is the ancestor of the digital music. It was like all this lumber. You know, I I I I really not familiar with that, but. But you want me to do it? I try. I can. I can try. I. I then I told the the conduct uh, the director. I say that, okay. You know that you're asking me to do two of the thing that it is not my profession. I was like, what? I'm not a Chinese musician. I'm. I'm not conducting major. So are you sure about that? They was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. You can do that. You you did pretty well. You know, for for your wife piece. I was like, okay. Let's give it a try. And that was like back to 2002. 
And since then, I've been, you know, doing it, getting familiar and familiar with the music. And then I feel that, you know, more comfortable with that. And um, right now I feel like, yeah, that, that's just, you know, okay to me now. Uh, the, the Chinese ensemble, the one thing about the, the Chinese musician and their location is I feel like it's very, um, you know, for them, they was like transposing. It's just, it's just not a thing to them, you know. I, in the Western music, it's like maybe for the jazz musician, they can do that, you know, if a singer is not going to sing good to that, oh, I want to drop a key tonight, you know, like they can do, oh, okay, um, C major to B flat, sure, no problem. The same as the, the Chinese musician, they don't like the G key, okay, they just do it in D. If you don't like the D, oh, we can do it in C. It's because they just rethink the lumber, you know, all they have to do is just like an equation. One equal to G, okay, change to one equal to C and they just play it. So that's, that really amazed me. And, um, but for the music, you know, change, you know, from um, when I was in Hong Kong and up to here, it, it, it gave me some um, new experience because um, when I was in Hong Kong, I, I sort of like jazz a little bit, but not that much. Plus in Hong Kong, you know, the, um, the culture is like, if you want to study classical music, don't touch the jazz. The jazz will ruin your classical music. You know, you don't, you, you don't, don't do that, you know. But in here, there was like really, they, they really like, they coexist, they're friends, you know, and, um, and the, the music was just like, when you have the classical music element and the, uh, the jazz music element, they were just fine. They mix up really well, you know. I remember when I got on the airplane and when I came, came here, they, they were doing like, oh, they're united and they're doing their Rhapsody in Blue. I was like, oh yeah, that's the music I like. You know, I come to United States, I'm gonna study that kind of music. But you know, at least I came here, I did get a, a much more deeper training for the Western classical music, the symphony, stuff like that, the orchestra. I've been trained to the orchestral player anyway. But at the same time, I, I feel like the jazz music is just so much easier to accept. And um, then here people, they're much more open-minded. And then um, it was just, um, I'm so easy to, um, you know, get, make friends with, you know, some jazz musicians. Um, because I, I first came here, I went to Boston Conservatory, when I record a vocal. Um, the, um, they were just links to Berkeley, you know. I, I met a lot of, you know, Berkeley students back then. They're all jazz musicians. And I found that they're really cool. So that's totally changed my mind, yeah. So um, this is how I feel like, you know, that the, the change for me from, you know, from Hong Kong to here, I just really expand my, my boundary of the music. Thank you so much, Ray. So in hearing these stories, I, I, um, I was really intrigued by um, how things are transmitted and, and what sticks and what doesn't stick. Um, right, so Umi, I don't know if you grew up with your grandparents' music or did, did you learn that after you were an ethnomusicologist or how did you decide that that would be sort of the, the music you want to explore now, now uh, in, your, in your life? Um, Alex, I don't know when you became um, introduced to Afro-Brazilian music and when you had the opportunity to start playing it, um, but I, I would be interested to know how, how that uh, became your specialty and also um, with Sun, you know, and this is a fairly common story that, you know, Chinese musicians learn it in the US, even though they're from, <laughs> they're from Hong Kong or Taiwan or something, right? Um, so yeah, and, and, and Juhi, you know, you, you lived in so many different places that you're just sort of taking different blocks. Uh, do you have certain thoughts on what, what is sticking in your musical language and what is not sticking? Well, I actually thought it was really interesting what Chi Sun said about sort of going back and learning about Chinese music later. That's kind of been similar to me to a certain extent. You know, you're talking about what sticks. I never thought of myself as an Indian composer or as a Hong Kong composer or anything like that when I first came here. I was just writing music that I thought to write. And it's been interesting as I've become more and more aware and people ask me a lot about how being Indian and growing up in Hong Kong and this and that really affects the work that I'm doing and really affects the music that I write. I guess just kind of digging deeper into Indian classical music and listening to music from all these different places. I don't know that all of it sticks very directly for me. I don't know that I'm writing really Indian music or anything like that, but 
I think it comes together and sticks in some sort of multifaceted amalgus sort of way, um, just to create a language that hopefully is made up of parts of all of that. Um, I uh, can I talk about some maybe some similar things, you know, um, I, you know, it's a story, you know, when I, one time when I gave a master class in the um, University of Kentucky, then I, I told my, the, the tuba student that um, I, how I approach to the tuba, then I talk about a band story when I was in high school, you know, I just want to hang around with my friend, so I want, so my friend playing in a band, and um, one of my friends played trumpet, one of my friends played the tuba. So I, I told him, yeah, um, I want to hang out with them. So I, I, I told them, hey, I want to join a band too. And then um, they then they look at me and was like, oh, okay, uh, what do you want to play? At that time, you know, all these ch students, you know, they have a typical idea. It was like, oh, I want to play the saxophone. The saxophone is cool, um, you know, Kenny G, you know, stuff like that. But um, when they all look at me, then they started to laugh and give me a really, uh, you know, very spooky smile. You will be, you, I think you're going to be played tuba. It's like, what? What is, what's tuba? What is that? And I was like, my, yeah, one of my friends, right? This is the instrument I play. I was like, look at that. I was like, forget it, forget it. I'm not going to play that. I'm going to play saxophone, okay? Then I, I talked to, then I, I went to the band director and then I was like, Hi, um, I want to join the the school band. I was like, look at me. I was like, I, I was big back back then, you know, a tall guy. You know, like, um, well, we we have nothing left except for two, but you want to do that? What? Is there nothing else? No. Can I play the saxophone? I was like, if you want to do the saxophone, come back next year. I was like, okay, I, you know, I want to. You know, I want to hang out with my friend. So this is how I get started. Then when I told this story in the, in the my, in, you know, in here, in, in Kentucky, you know, in the college, and there's two, one of the students, one of, um, one of the, the students is there. Yeah, this is the story of all tuba players. <laughs> so they're, they're kind of similar, you know, even though you're Hong Kong or no matter where you are, all tuba players got the same story. You know, you do it big, you play tuba. <laughs> Umi, do you have thoughts? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think I think you know it goes back to some of what I was learning in grad school. Um, that sort of that inseparability, inseparable relationship between music and life. I think you know as my life's condition changes, I look for my family's kind of history and how they deal with the the changes in their lives and <clears throat> and so so that's got that's what's sort of been driving my own kind of intergenerational search in kind of similar life stories with different life stories but like happening at a different point where um you know i'm kind of i i got into sort of thinking about like music as a form of survival or music you know as something that that kind of explores the sort of like, you know, psychic state of like, um, social psychical state of like melancholia, like, you know, the complexity of like, you know, the deep blues and like, you know, the sort of, um, what's it, what does it feel like to lose something, you know, the feelings of loss and mourning. And, and I think, you know, that, you know, I, my music, my musical sources often came from like distant memories of like something I had heard one time in my life, you know, either it was like a radio show that my grandparents were listening to and, you know, I was just like kind of hanging out in their room while my grandpa had his radio on and, you know, I grew up in Taiwan and uh, he had, he was like a perpetual radio consumer. So like, I just remember like, all these interesting kind of sounds, you know, from uh, jingles <laughs> that were from like uh, like these medicine shows that that would re-manifest themselves on the radio, um, and then playing these like old time songs, you know, talking about like um, the bitterness of life. <laughs> it's like you know, I was like, wow, that's cool, but it, like never stick. It it kind of stuck in a way back of my head, but then like later on in life, I thought, oh god, like 
I'm dealing with something that's also kind of bitter, but in my own way, like, you know, dealing with, um, you know, sort of people not recognizing who I am, you know, as an Asian American person, as a non-binary person, like, there is like a sense of loss that I'm dealing with. It may not be the same thing that they were dealing with, but I heard it through their music. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I was able to kind of retrieve that in my own personal archive. Um, yeah. Okay. Great, thank uh, you. Real quick, I want to say a couple things. Uh, one in response to Chi Sun's uh, story. It's it's interesting to me the some, sometimes or oftentimes arbitrary circumstances that you know uh, send us a, on a, on a path. I uh, in sixth grade in in the, band, the middle school band, uh, the band director told me on the first day um, that I was going to play trombone. So I went home and I told my dad I was going to play trombone. He said, No, you're not. <laughs> And he's like, you're already playing piano, so you should focus your studies on piano. And if you want to be in the band, maybe you can play percussion. I guess the I guess the the subtext is you don't have to practice as much. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get. I guess the um, yeah, you know, you know the uh, one of the uh, the very uh, famous composer, you know, the uh, Lee Wois Anderson, you know, the guy who composed the um, Slay Y. Yeah, that composer, you know, he. He, his father wanted him to, to be in the front row of the marching band. So he made him play the trombone. <laughs> because you're trom if you're a trombone player, you, you know, you have to slide, you know, you can, right. have to be in the front row. You, right. If you put in the back row, well, people in front of you got, got in trouble. Well, I, that, that was never my, my fate or my destiny, apparently. So percussion became it and, and uh, I've just, um, it's it's interesting how it was sort of a, you know, a, a secondary choice, but became a you know a primary mode of, of, my, of Actually, my practice. you know what, you know Chinese percussion. I I get to you know I I, I learned it in here. I have we have a very good teacher here who teaches um, Chinese percussion. But he he's a, a Yangqin profession, by the way. But he's really good at the Chinese percussion. So this is how I get started. And I when I learned it from him, I was like, oh geez, I wish that I had I I could meet him. You know earlier, you know, I think he had so much to offer me for the Chinese percussion. And it just um, really totally opened my mind to the um, Chinese musical world. Because, um, you know, as we know that the Chinese music basically is the erhu, you know, the dizi, you know, yangqi, all these Chinese instruments, you can name it, but no one will gonna say da gu, or, or, you know, the, the, the big drums, you know, or the Chinese percussion stuff. But he introduced me there's so many things that I, I really wish that I could keep learning from him. You know, he's old now, you know, he couldn't um, do much more teaching. But, um, you know, all the things that come from his hand is just amazing, you know. You know, you, you, didn't, you, you didn't know that Chinese percussion music could be so much fun and, so, and there's uh, so much depth in it until he, he, in, he introduced me. So I really learned a lot from him and, and it made me fall in love with percussion a lot. You know, I, I, one time I was thinking like, hmm, maybe if I can restart again, maybe I, will, I chose to be a percussion major, you know? Yeah. Well, thanks for, yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's, it's quite a journey. Once you start having to carry your percussion around with you, you start to wish you had did something, <laughs> something else, you know? Um, yeah. So what, 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 what if you, if you don't be, if you, if you can be a percussion player, what 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 you want to be, and it's for everyone though. If you are not playing your instrument now, what what would that be? Um, I I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. <laughs> but uh, Eric, the last thing I just wanted to say was uh, uh, with respect to your question was just just you know these kind of different cultural perspectives and also what what we value you know i did grow up in a western music western classical music you know perspective and you know how how uh, intonation for example is something that's very highly esteemed like you know it's it's, it's very important and and as i became more exposed to other other musical traditions in, in which that that was um maybe not not um held in the same kind of uh, regard in terms of value. You know, I've had the, the kinds of hierarchical ways in which we value music or value certain musical elements in, in Western classical music, I think has been challenged a lot by 
by, by you know, looking at, looking at musical practice from multiple cultural perspectives. Um, and it's just something that's been, been humbling through the, through, the, through the years of, you know, engaging in these kinds of conversations, checking my own implicit biases around that and the ways that, you know, how con sort of classical music training um, f shapes the way that we should be hearing the world and should be practicing our instrument and should be engaging in music making. And I'm just very grateful that I've had the opportunity to um, be in so many diverse kinds of music making experiences that that break from from that that um, from those frameworks. Um, so that's just thinking about kind of the different influences and thinking about whether that's in an intergenerational perspective or just even within my own peer network. Um, you know, just how how to navigate those kinds of different spaces of of, of musical aesthetic um, from a different cultural perspective. So. So um, just a quick follow-up. Um, when, when were you introduced to Afro-Brazilian music and what made it stick? Yeah, I, it was in high school. Um, I, I became very good friends with a, with a student from Bogota, Colombia, whose mother was uh, coming to Virginia Tech um, to, to do a gra graduate degree program. So his name is Felipe Posada, and he introduced me to a lot of Latin uh, music and, and, uh, and also to Brazilian music. And when I, I think being a percussionist already and, and the the intensity of, the, of of these percussion traditions in this music i it just it called me in a way that i had no explanation for i was just struck and i think that growing up at this time this was in the early 90s pre-internet uh in southwest semi-rural virginia i was kind of in a desert you know culturally speaking as it, as it pertains to brazilian music and you know i i give the ex i give the the analogy of like um you know, somebody in the dark having to go into a room and feel the shape of the room and then draw everything in the room, you know. So it was basically through music I, I got that education. And I, I was just fixated on Brazilian music for years and years and years. And um, going, finally getting a chance during college years, getting a chance to go um, and, um, and making that a part. So I've been going to Brazil now for over 20 years. And just, it's you know, my second home at this point. But yeah, it's a very confusing. And then, you know, I know that we're going to be talking a little bit about race. So maybe I'll just segue quickly into saying that um, because of my kind of ambiguity, the privilege of ambiguity in terms of how I, I appear uh, raci racially, I think I've been, been able to, it's been interesting to see how people perceive me in Brazil, um, how people who know me through the context of Brazilian music here in, in the United States or in Philadelphia, how they perceive me as well, my own identity through my, through my practice. Um, it's, been, it's been really an interesting process. So I'll, I'll let you go ahead and jump into the next question, but. Okay, great. Yeah.